This is episode 264 of the Books, Shows, Tunes, and Mad Acts podcast. This episode is titled, The Guest Book with Sarah Blake. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Books, Shows, Tunes, and Mad Acts. I'm your host, Jennifer Crittenden. Books, Shows, Tunes, and Mad Acts is brought to you by Discreet Guide, the training company for improving your speaking and writing skills. Thank you for joining us and tune in on Mondays for new episodes. I am really pleased to welcome Sarah Blake to the show today. She is the author of the book that we're going to talk about today, uh, The Guest Book. So welcome, Sarah. Hey, thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, I'm thrilled to have you. I actually met Sarah sort of serendipitously when I was going to schedule an interview with Sarah Blake, who wrote Clean Air back in, I don't know, 20... 2020, 2021, something like that. Um, but I was so happy to discover this other Sarah Blake and her books. And I'm excited to talk about uh, this really interesting novel today. But I'll just introduce her very briefly. Again, uh, this is another guest who has sent me a very short bio. She's the author of a book of poems and three novels. Grange House and the New York Times bestsellers, The Postmistress, and the book that we're going to talk about today. And she lives in Washington, D.C. Okay, so I want to start with going over the scope of this novel, which is significant. And the Washington Post said in its review that this novel is monumental in a way that few novels dare attempt. I thought that was interesting on multiple levels and kind of an indication of the sort of novels that we expect today, maybe compared to a hundred years ago. And I was really curious to ask you, did you conceive of this book in its complexity or did it just sort of happen as you explored these themes? It's a great question because it has to do with, with process, obviously, but that quote from the Washington Post, you know, the word monumental is something that is so loaded mm. in both, you know, sort of cultural memory, but then um, especially in, in the way in which it starts to play out in this book. But I'll back up. I always, always wanted to write a big, you know, juicy, uh, multi-generational family saga where, um, you know, with lots of uh, secrets and histories that are buried and then uncovered and um, very much in the tradition of, you know, House of Spirits by Isabel Allende or um, Virginia Woolf's The Years. I mean, I just love the idea that, I mean, for me very much, past and present, especially in families, is always going on at the same time. And mm -hmm. especially when we don't know truly who our parents or grandparents were, if we don't know their histories or if we haven't, if, if they haven't told us, there are ways in which I feel that the, the present often is repeating the past without even knowing that we're doing it. And one of the things I wanted to do with this novel was I wanted to think about the way in which family memory is passed on. And when I started the book, there's a very long winded way of answering your question. No, no, please. You know, it took about nine years to write. But when I started the book, Obama had just announced or, or he was, you know, in the middle of his campaign. It was 2008. He, you know, very much at that point, it's hard to, to sort of remember back uh, to that time in terms of where the country's uh, sort of public conversation about race was. Mm -hmm. But he, when he sort of announced, and there was a, a big speech he gave in Philadelphia in which he reminded us that, um, he reminded us of the quote, um, Faulkner's quote, that the past, it, the past isn't dead in this country, it isn't even past. Mm -hmm. And he called us to remember that his race was very much going to be front and center in um, this country as as the first black man to take that mantle. And I just remember at the time being electrified by 
this and hearing it as a kind of call to arms. I wanted to more and more. I wanted to have that conversation on the surface of sort of of the public uh, discourse, and I wanted to enter that conversation myself. And so the novel very much was my way of thinking aloud about race and memory and how and thinking about how a family history or a family story would be a good way to actually think about um, the ways in which racism and anti-Semitism are buried in family memories and family bodies and then how that's an expression of a kind of national memory. So I was very much wanting to use the the sort of structure of the kind of conventional family saga mm. to think about race and class in this country and how it gets passed down without really ever being overtly said. Yeah, that's one thing that I think is really done really effectively in the novel is I think, you know, we kind of expect racism to reveal itself in some obvious ways and also anti-Semitism. But in fact, in your novel, I think it's much more realistic where there's sort of an undercurrent of expectations or the way people are expected to behave, especially if they're guests. You know, they're, it's quite nuanced and I think it's more realistic, uh, honestly. So I appreciated that very much about the novel. It's subtle. Right. Which, yeah, which is great because I think that's real. Well, I think I think also that um, the subtlety is in, I mean, subtlety is one way of also talking about silence. And I, mm. I do feel like so much gets passed down without ever being said. And that it's that that I'm interested in, because, of course, that's the that's the part that's hardest to, to catch. And um, and I think that's why its power can sort of sustain and continue and repeat. Um, I mean, over gen you know generation after generation. Yeah, and easy to deny, right? Exactly, because it's not overt. So exactly. everything's cool, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, what, even what's the problem? Yeah, right. Exactly. I should mention, uh, since you brought up 2008, that the book was actually published in 2019 and the paperback version came out in May of 2020. So mm -hmm. indeed, yeah, it was a long time between your uh, conception of the novel and when we actually got to read it. And and actually, those 10 years or whatever they were, nine years, were massive in terms mm -hmm. of the the changes and um as to how i think as a as a country we began began you know and obviously george floyd's murder in 2020 was i mean that that was we had already there had been already 10 years of trayvon martin and you know michael brown and and just the 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 sense of how, just how much were we looking away how much were we willing to look away and then i think that that, you know, kind of collapsed in June of 2020 or, or, you know, the end of May when he was murdered. But I think that the book really shifted a lot as I, oh. I mean, as the years went by, because as I'm trying to tell a story about hidden or denied racism and anti-Semitism, that was absolutely what was playing out you know, outside my study, <laughs> you know, so, right. and how do I contend with that? How do I, and, and actually also, how do I um, take it on? I mean, all my books really are trying to think about like, okay, I see this, what do I do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another thing I really appreciated is some of the African-American characters that you have in your book. When we go into their interiority and you speak in their voices. Mm -hmm. I think that's especially interesting to a white person like me to see what is happening there. That was one of the things that I appreciated the most about the book was these these are complicated. We can't reduce feelings about racism to simple ideas. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was also very well characterized in the book. I, I really appreciated that. I don't know how much you worked on that or if that came naturally to you, but that, that was something that I thought was very special about the book. Well, thank you. 
I think you're you're probably mostly talking about the character Reg. Yeah, and all and also that colleague of Evie's. Yes, of Evie's, yeah. I mean, Reg, the he is he's a major character and and in fact he is of all of the characters, he's the only one who whose name isn't in the guest book. Um the actual very, very book telling, right? On the <laughs> island. And yet he is the one, and this is something that actually a reader pointed out to me very early on. Reg is the only he is the only one not in the guest book, but he is actually the one who knows the whole story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's in a position both as I mean, or he's in this sort of um, in some ways, the kind of iconic position of the outsider he sees better than anybody else. But he's also been both placed outside as well as taken himself outside. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, the 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 sort of agency that he has is um, is complicated. But um, one of the things, and and I see in in one of your questions, you you re refer to the quote by James Baldwin. People are trapped in history, and history is trapped in them, which is very much that it, it appears at the front of the book. Um, it's one of the epigraphs. This idea of history being inside us, mm -hmm. and how we, um, when we're you know acting both unconsciously and consciously, how we are expressing a kind of historical being. Um, this is something that was just completely essential to my thinking of structure of, of this book. But Baldwin, um, the reason I bring him up here in conjunction with Reg and Reg's character is that it doesn't come naturally to me to be able to to write a character like this. This was, um, I mean, I am a white woman, you know, born in 1960. James Baldwin has always been essential to me, to my thinking and to my writing. But in this book in particular, I just I read uh, probably everything that he has written as much um, for what he for, you know, his content as for the way and, you know, just getting that voice inside mm -hmm. my head. Mm -hmm. I also have been, you know, I have a long, long uh, friendship with the um, African-American poet uh, Claudia Rankin. She's one oh. of my great friends. And so she and I have been really talking about this for 30 years. And mm -hmm. so again, I feel like I've had the, well, just the immense good fortune of being able to try and figure out who we are in relation to each other, both as friends and as women. And, and you know, and, and so the conversation very much informed informs always when I write a character who's not a white woman, you know, but and especially a black character as as here. So it's not natural, but I have been listening a long time. Mm -hmm. I thought it was very revealing. Okay, so do some nuts and bolts here about the novel. So the setting, uh, there are various settings in the book, but the primary setting uh, by far in fact, it's such an important location, you could almost call it a character in the book, is a private island off the coast of Maine that's owned by the Miltons. And we watch their possession of the island and their attitude toward the island and the activities that take place on the island across uh, several generations. You also mention an island in your acknowledgments. So tell us about islands. <laughs> Well, first of all, in a novel that's about uh, sort of, well, let's just say self-imposed blindness and kind of willful, mm -hmm. willful mythologizing, the symbol of an island is just too good to, you know, not use. Um, so <laughs> there's that. But honestly, you know, this book is as much about my trying to understand the history inside my family um, as it is, you know, this sort of larger thing. And and I do come from an old um, wasp, old money family. The the book is fiction, but the place is not. When in 1936, my grandparents did, in fact, um, sail by um, an island off the coast of Maine and tacked into the cove because there was a for sale sign and bought it. That island continues to be in that in our family since then, there's four generations at now at this point, five have been um, children there and teenagers there and 
um, adults and then parents themselves and, and continued. And so the, the sort of overlay of family voices, both inside us, but then also um, played out over a landscape is something completely familiar to me. So I grew up on such a place as, as the imagined island here in the guest book. To a certain degree, I mean, just as you say, it is a character, but, and in some ways it's the most, probably the most autobiographical character because it's, it, it's unmitigated. It, it absolutely is described the way um, it appears to me and the place and the, the landscape and the, the paths, everything is um, in some senses literal. And that was essential because it allowed me to move in terms of in and out of story, because I was could always return to a place that I knew very well. And, you know, the house is the same. So we do have this island still. And the acknowledgments are to members of my family who sort of have held on to it financially, which, in, you know, enables all of us to go. Oh, my gosh, I didn't realize it was quite so real. It's, that's very interesting, because it is uh, visually, it's so strong, right? Mm. I have a, I have a very clear picture of the island and the house and uh, the barn. Yeah, very yeah. interesting. It's kind of funny. And I started reading the book, and so the grandmother, uh, Kitty, very interesting character. I have deep fondness for her. She goes by Granny K later, as does my mother. Um, so, so that was kind of a surprising. Oh, uh, when that came up, I was uh, mostly listening to the book with an audio version. So the first time I heard the name Granny Kay, I was like, oh, that, that's <laughs> weird. Okay, that's different. And then the other thing that was quite odd was that my siblings and I have inherited a large, unusual property uh, this past year. So the jury is still out about whether or not we're going to be able to exist as co-owners and get along. Although so far we're trying very hard to do that and potentially to hold on to that property. So there's a scene in your book uh, later on when the younger generations are trying to figure out what to do with the island, with its expense, and what does it mean in this modern era to try and maintain a private island. And then, yeah, they have so a couple of scenes, one in particular, where they're really fighting about what to do with this island. And I swear, it just sent such a chill up my back about, oh, no, <laughs> this is our destiny. We're all going to end up ruining our relationships <laughs> over this property. So all of that was definitely uh, too close to home. Mm -hmm. um, but but seemed very realistic, right, because of because of these major questions that happen. I think especially more and more as property is changing hands in the modern era. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was a very interesting experience to, as I say, very close to home. So the book uh, switches back and forth in time. Did you write it that way or did you write it in a linear fashion and then jumble the sections later? So actually, let me just, because if your um, listeners haven't read the book, which, you know, absolutely Let's assume that I want to just sort of establish who the three generations are. Yeah. Um, and then we can, you know, talk about how I wove them. But so the the book moves back and forth in time in um, the 30s, uh, 1959 and the present. And so there are these three generations. Kitty and Ogden are the matriarch and patriarch. Um, we see them first in the, you know, in the very first chapter in 35 and then they you know we see them again in 36 when they buy the island and then um but and so there's a whole section that centers around the period right before um it was really clear what was going on um in nazi germany um before the nuremberg laws i'm always interested in setting my books um not in the kind of height of when when you know a historical moment has happened but always right before it when it's when it's not quite clear we see um ogden's relationship to he's a businessman and he's his relationship to german businessmen um and he, he is dealing with um, members of um, german steel 
and then his wife Kitty is, you know, back in New York. But so, so the the thirties is um, kind of grounded in in thirty five, thirty six. You know, do you remember in thirty six during the Olympics, there was a lot of whitewashing. So again, it's a period. You, if you were Jewish, you would see what was going on. If you were also paying attention, you would know what was going on. If you didn't want to know what was going on, you would not know what was going, or you would, you know, sort of continue. So, so I was interested in that. So the book, so the '30s section is kind of in in that era. 1959, um, which is when the their children, Moss, Joan and Evelyn are the period in 1959. It's just that year and it's really just that summer um, when uh, we, we watch these three um, and they're all in their 20s. And so at that point, Kitty and Ogden are, you know, older parents, but they all are on the island because of this, you know, the, they've been going for years. Again, it's 1959. Moss, who is the, you know, the only son, um, is a jazz musician, wants to be a musician, but really is destined to run his father's company and fights against that. He is great friends with Reg, whom we spoke of, this um, African-American writer. And he invites Reg and his friend, Reg's best friend, Len, who is Jewish, to come up to the island. He invites them to sort of out of the blue. And so they arrive into a party in 1959. And so that's the kind of stew pot of the 50s and how that's all brought together. And then the third generation is the present generation, and that's Evie, who is a uh, medieval historian. She teaches at NYU. Her mother is Joan, who is who we've um, heard of. And basically, she's a historian who doesn't know her own history. Mm -hmm. So we we see the ways in which and and, and um, in the present, her mother, Joan, has just died. But Evie keeps remembering. She's trying to remember, like, like why you know sort of what happened but specifically because her mother has said i want to be buried at the end of the island and with a a spoon and so so those are the sort of three generations and how they um move you know how they sort of move in and out it was incredibly hard to figure uh -huh. out how to do that <laughs> and it took me years i mean in many ways i mean that's why it took so long or not so long, but that's why, you know, it took the eight years because I really did want to take seriously or or I wanted to take almost literally this notion of history being trapped inside us. Mm. And so what what does that look like when you're playing it out in, in narrative? And so I wanted to build a story where you were seeing literally the past and the present going on at the same time. And we were seeing how it played out. And so to do it, you know, we begin in the 30s and go through the 50s and then into the, you know, present would have not achieved that. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't have achieved the sense of repetition or anything like that. So I kept, I, I kept sort of writing it, moving, flipping back and forth, but then there was no kind of urgency between the sections. And so it it really was a lot of mm -hmm. um, writing it straight and then um, breaking it up and trying to intersperse. But it really wasn't until I understood that if I buried something on the island that, you know, a secret and mm -hmm. then sort of moved around that, that the island was going to be the thing that I kept returning to, that that was the way that I could anchor these stories moving through. And so basically to set it, the bulk of the novel in this one night in 1959, where everything comes together of the 30s and the 50s. And then from that, the present comes to understand, Evie comes to understand why she's burying her mother at the end of the island. Yeah, it works well. It's almost literally anchored at the island. Yeah. That persistence, you know, and there's something really compelling about that, about how geography persists through, you know, humans, gyrations and uh, across the generations, but the land is still there. And yeah, there's something to me, at least very interesting uh, about all that. But don't you think this is why, you know, issues like why homeland, the ideas of homelands and the ideas of places that you return to that 
either you own, but then you, they own you. I mean, yeah. that when you return to it, and, and this could be, I mean, there, this is an island and so this is quite grand, but this could also just be, you know, the dining room you always had, you know, dinners with, with your grandparents or, or you know, that sense of return and that sense of a place that, that holds you, a place that remembers you as much as you remember it. And I think this is, this is why they're so hard fought and why families, you know, both insist on holding them, but also, you know, they can be quite, they can be obviously quite fraught. Mm, burdensome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they're more than just the land. Exactly. Right. Yeah. You're carrying the weight of your whole family tradition. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. One of my favorite parts of the book is the section where uh, Evie is talking to her students about history. And uh, she talks about uh, Bible. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, this is a, a great little thing. This is one of the great things about writing um, novels that have that are based in historical research as much as, you know, contemporary story. You know, I, I wanted Evie to be a historian always. I I live here in D.C. and I have friends who teach at Georgetown. And I was at a, I don't know, a dinner a long time ago and was talking to a medieval historian who was telling me about um the, these women who are buried, who were sort of blocked in on the side of cathedrals or monasteries, and they lived there their whole lives um, in this sort of chamber. They were they were sort of the symbolic heart and soul of the larger institution, and they were called anchoresses. I just thought, I mean, I had never heard of this, and I just thought, oh my god, you know that. Is- <laughs> So again, there's like, that's a perfect, you know, sort of metaphor for in in my head. And and the section that's the the first section of the book is called The Anchoress. And I think very much about women in the 30s and the 50s who basically were, you know, they were given the role and they took it. And Minx's power came in that in being the sort of heart and soul of the patriarchy, of the the sort of center um, or of the institution and that in many ways bound them, the very same institution that gave them power by their silence and by their devotion. I wanted to have that figure in there. And so Evie is, I um, imagined that her, all of her, both doctoral work and her professional work centered around these anchoresses and that she is telling her students about, I mean, this I made up completely, but that there is, she was saying that she had understood really what history was when she had looked at, you know, she was researching one of these anchoresses books and um, the pages were rubbed away, you know, where she had, where the anchoress had, you know, she, where she, I guess the word God, I can't even remember now what, what it is. Mm-hmm. And she had understood that the wiping away was really the sign of, of the girl or of the woman, that mm-hmm. that was, she was praying and she was, you know, she was doing it with her finger. And so there was the real person in it. And that was how she understood history. You know that that you see in these um, documents, you see the the people this way, right? Yeah, her touch on that word has worn away the word, but somehow, yeah, that's how she herself is actually revealed by the, yeah. the mark that she's left. Uh, yeah, there's something really compelling, and also just in general, that lecture that Evie gives to the students, I thought was quite. Fascinating. Did you attend some uh, lectures uh, in order to write that? No, but I, I've been a teacher for a long time. So, uh, mm-hmm. no, I mean, that that is pretty much straight up my idea of, of history and, you know, the notion of paying attention to, you know, the people on the margins. I mean, my the novel, The Postmistress, which came before that, was mm-hmm. very much about you know, the the faces in the crowd that are are not, you know, caught up in historical record, but that mm-hmm. very much that is who we are. And, you know, asking ourselves who we are um, is a way to think about, you know, understanding history, who were they, how and, and you know, vice versa. When um, 
I lived in in Berlin for a year while I was in the middle of writing this novel with my family. Oh. And there are um, th these uh, stones that I that the novel they come up in the novel, but called yeah. Stoppelsteine, which are these buried uh, sort of paving stones with the that are yeah they're they're implanted or they're um, buried outside the last place a Jewish family or a person lived or worked before they were taken. And so all over the city, there are these stones with their with the names of people. And I remember that one of the things that when I first started to see them, and then I just followed them all over the city. I mean, there are hundreds of them. It made me stop in the place where something had happened. And it forced that question of, you know, imagining like what had taken place there and then thinking about all the people who might have seen what was taking place there and who were they and then that again this question you know who were they and then it forces the question so who would you be who would you be if you saw that and so that again that the past and present are forced into a kind of uh conversation so evie's lecture to her students is that she is saying you know, before you can understand, before you look back, first look at yourself mm -hmm. and first look at, you know, Whitney, she's asking her students, you know, it, would you have, what would you have done, you know, if you were in the towers? Would you have run? Would you have stayed at your desk? And, and you know, so always asking yourself to be honest, who are you in order to understand or to try and read the historical record, you know, first. So I have, I mean, I've taught college and I've taught high school. So making a seminar is, you know, that was something that does, does come naturally, but I also wanted to actually say all that. <laughs> so. No, yeah, it's really well done. I think you could pull that right out of the book and that would be, you know, yeah, something interesting for people. And also the thing about the stones, I knew nothing about that. And I was quite shocked, actually, when I was listening to that part. I had no idea. It's really yeah. quite a remarkable visual, right, of going around the city and seeing these stones. Well, it's, it is wonderful. I mean, we should, your listeners should know there, it's easy to, um, you know, to sort of look up and to Google. It's, it was started out as a public art project in uh, 92, I think, hmm. by an, an artist whose first name is Gunter, and I can't remember his last, a, a German artist who wanted to do, to, to do this, to basically, you know, have the present interrupted by the past. Mm. And so he, he started researching, you know, where things had happened. And then as it grew, there were many, many, many families who asked, you know, who paid for, who did the research and then paid for the stones to be implanted. And it's it's still going on. I mean, he's still doing it. And it spread way past Berlin. I mean, it's all over Europe now, wow. this idea. And and the Stoppelsteine, and I may not be pronouncing it exactly right, but it means stumble stone, mm -hmm. um, literally. And it comes from, or the idea of a stumble stone. And it's, it's literally a paving stone. So, it, you know, in many of these old cities, it's the it's cobblestones yeah but there used to be in the you know sort of middle ages and then right up until the present there would be this kind of folk curse which is if if somebody if a gentile tripped somebody would say oh a jew must be buried there and so that you know that was so this this idea of of both stumbling on history and forcing all that was also deeply embedded literally, literally in mm -hmm. a kind of in the folkloric anti-Semitism that if you trip, it's because a Jew is is beneath your feet. This artist at, in the way of great art took the simplest, purest kind of, in this case, expression of anti-Semitism and turned it on itself memori and memorialized it, which goes back to, you know, this, the question you asked in the beginning, the, the way in which monuments are are used here mm -hmm. and how we overturn how do we both uh memorialize and without uh turning them and without weaponizing them basically yeah i mean the analogies and metaphors here abound right once yeah. again there's a marker there of someone of something or someone who is no longer there yeah right yeah yeah, yeah. it's really interesting so I'm going to leap to another question because uh, this seems appropriate here. So you're also a poet, 
Um, uh-huh. And and you know these these metaphors, these ideas, the rubbed out uh, word of God in the Bible, the stumble stones, those all feel very poetic to me. When you think about yourself as a novelist compared to other novelists, uh, how do you think poetry informs your writing? Well, I have to be completely come clean and say that I haven't written a poem for years and years and years. And in fact, it was this friend of mine, you know, who was who is a poet, um, and I were talking about the whole notion of the anchoress. And we said, you know, we sort of set ourselves like, oh, let's write a poem about that. He went on to write a poem and a very good poem and a very good book that's, you know, titled that. I never wrote another poem again. That said, however, I feel that learning how to write came through being a poet first, because poetry, or certainly the way that I was writing it, Um, requires you to slow down, to be, you know, to slow down and to pay attention to not just words, but also uh, the punctuation between the words, um, the music that each line is singing and or not, um, and the way in which you can, the way in which narrative moves. I mean, my poems were always very narrative. Um, so it's, pro- you know, in hindsight, it's just, it's pretty clear that that's where I, at one point or another, I was going to have to blast past the end of a poem because I just couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't stop, you know, just, um, I couldn't close it. I couldn't close an idea the way that, you know, really good poems close them by leaving, by having put so many, by having put images up on the surface that hold the the question. So even though the poem comes to an end, that's what I mean about closing. The the questions are up there in the in the images, in the yeah, in the kind of motion of between images. If my books are poetic, it's that I learned, I think, how to do what I'm trying to do by writing poems. Or writing, yeah, by writing poems. I don't want to do any spoilers here because I do want my readers to read the book. I think that they would find it quite interesting. But this issue about closing, I think, is very interesting because the book, at least in my reading, these questions are still up there. Mm -hmm. I definitely get the feeling from the book that history continues, we continue as a species, uh, although the generations close and open. But these questions that you've raised in the novel endure. Do you Mm -hmm. feel that way about the book or do you feel as though you answered something? It's a great question. So I do feel that the, the book, I mean, what I, what I think I'm proudest about in this book is that I really did want to understand and by writing it out, how it is that, um, we can, we can carry on basically racism and and uh, you know structural anti-semitism and race how is how does that happen and and how does that happen um in families and i really wanted to sort of play it out in a family like mine to understand how it is that i had come to have what i had you know inside me and and i won't give anything away but the the story leaves very much open what i mean the characters come to see who they are mm. a little bit more clearly but it's not necessarily clear what they'll do and i think that this is perhaps you know to your your point about the species continues and history continues this is the perennial question so once you see mm. what do you do mm-hmm. how do you answer the beginning of sort of the call, the story that you've heard. How do you how do you situate yourself? What do you do with it now? With that knowledge now, mm-hmm. so whatever closure I got out of this was that I had put it all down on the page. Yeah. But I'm I mean the novel I'm writing now is still basically asking like what do you do? What mm-hmm. what do you do when you discover something that is that has you know that's been buried? And what does that mean? What does that ask of you? 
Um, what's our responsibility to mm -hmm. telling secrets? I mean, in, in this novel, they're, they're secrets, but if you were to just open that up and think of it, you know, as history, once you know, you know, the sort of extent of, um, I mean, you know, Jim Crow and, and the ways in which monuments that we took for granted or, or just didn't see in front of us, once you re-see, once it's in, put in front of you, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, that perhaps is the thing that uh, I will always be asking. It's a very profound question, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe that's why we don't have answers, but you do get some sense of closure as, as you keep learning. Mm -hmm. Right. But but that word that you used responsibility that really resonates with me. Right. This question of how responsible are we as individuals and it's people make different choices, obviously, about how they spend their energy and their time. But, yeah, it may be a fundamental question about our time here mm -hmm. on Earth is what is your responsibility and what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's 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 just yeah, it's all very interesting. I think you've raised some just yeah, terrific things for us to think about. I want to talk a little bit about Moss's song because of this. So I'll let you explain it. So Moss, who um, I said a little bit about, he's you know the character who wants to be, who, who would love to be able to you know be a musician, has. He he very much sees that all the kind of opening around him, both mm -hmm. in terms of possibility, it's 1959, and, and just thinking about, again, that time period, everything that's going to explode open in the 60s and in the civil rights, um, that is coming, but it's not yet there. But there's very much the sense of, again, of new notes. At one point, he's, I, I, again, I can't remember quite remember, but he is saying that one of his jazz heroes had said, find me some new notes. Um, and that, um, George, and that that sense that that artists need to find the, the new notes, they need to tell the new stories in order to, in fact, both herald, but also to express this sense that things are changing, that there yeah. are, that there's a new, you know, there, there's a, there's new music you know, both symbolically as as well as literally that's happening and very much was happening in, in 59. And um, he is a he is a, a dreamer. He's an idealist and believes that change really is coming. And to a certain degree, I mean, he can see what the what the others can see and resist. And this includes Reg, who is a very dear friend. And in fact, there's a question, I mean, they're quite close. There's a question of just how close they are. Um, nothing is consummated, but they are very um, attached. And Reg sees uh, Moss's idealism as kind of hopeless and, and also naive. Mm -hmm. And very much, you know, I mean, the, the product of being somebody who is, he's a Milton. He has been, you know, he's many generations of, money and and power and prestige he's comes from one of the old families of the country so his regs it's not that he looks askance at what what moss's idealism but he he puts it into perspective for us you know mm -hmm. as we're watching um and to a certain degree it's moss's moss behaves in a certain way towards the end of the novel that reg feels just exemplifies the fact that in the end, he always was just a Milton. He's not actually able to change, which really devastates Moss. So the notion of new notes and new songs, whether that's possible, um, whether or not we're always going to be singing the old song over and over, even if we can find the new notes, that's Moss is a, is a singer and he, um, and he can hear music that the rest of us can't. But that in and of itself is part of the problem is, you know, is a question as to just how far, you know, that song will go. And um, Moss in the end is the, I mean, certainly in my book, the most tragic of them all, mm -hmm. um, because he actually can see. And one of the things that Reg comes to see as well, or comes to say, 
you know, that we weren't ready. We did, you know, he, he sang too soon. This notion again of like, what do you do when you want to achieve change or when you want to um, call attention to its possibility, just, you know, how hard it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how hard it is. Yeah, it's not like a Hallmark movie where the music swells at the end and it's all good now. Everything's right. everything's forgiven. We're, we're all fine. So yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about the writing. Uh, how would you contrast this book with your first two? I haven't read those, so I was curious about your thoughts about that. Well, my first novel was, I had gotten a um, doctorate in Victorian literature and I wrote my dissertation on Charlotte Bronte and her sisters. And in particular, Charlotte's authorial competition with Emily and with a, a, a very strong female a sister, basically the kind of rivalry. I was really interested in ways in which Victorian novels are always are about buried stories being told mm -hmm. and especially the, you know, the sort of triple decker, the, the three layers of um, narrative. So I got to the end of my dissertation and I just I didn't really want to go on into academia. I just wanted more Bronte novels. And so I just decided, well, I'll write one. Ah. So so the first one, which is called Grange House, is um, set in 1896 off the coast of Maine, um, or actually on the coast of Maine. And it centers on this this sort of, this woman, you know, it's called Grange House, so this house and the woman who owns it, and then the family that comes to visit the, the Granges. And it taught me a lot, but it definitely taught me how to go back and forth in time, mm. but not as fluidly at all as what I did in the guest book. Then in the postmistress, again, it also goes back in back and forth, uh, not in time, but in, in space. So it um, looks at uh, three women um, oh. again in 1941. Bef so before our country had entered World War II, but the rest of the world was, was already in it. Mm -hmm. And it moves back and forth between um, a young woman um, who's living in a town called Franklin, Massachusetts, which is sort of modeled on Provincetown on the Cape, the very end of the Cape. Uh -huh. Um, the woman in the who runs the post office in that town, Iris, and then a radio journalist, um, Frankie Bard, who's over in London, just basically reporting on the Blitz. She works for Edward R. Murrow. So she oh. is on the radio and we hear her. And so in some ways, that novel moves in terms of radio way, you know, stories that come, she, you know, somebody, bro Frankie broadcasts, and then that broadcast is heard. And then you sort of stay in the place where that broadcast is heard, if you know what I mean. The the central sort of figure of it is that Emma, who is the woman, has written a letter, which Iris has not delivered. And so it's the what like what happens when a letter isn't delivered and and there's all the and you know it's it's basically a war novel at the center of which is an undelivered piece of mail. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds fascinating. I love this idea of something arriving in another place, right? Whether it's news or a broadcast or a letter. And then you you explore that for a while and then right. that takes you someplace else. Yeah, it's a really it's a really uh, intriguing uh, mechanism to move this story. The audio version that I listened to for the guest book had a teaser at the end for Grange House, which I listened to, uh, which sounded really great. So yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, listening to that one as well. I was curious about your feelings towards your characters, like who were the characters, if there, you had a favorite character uh, to write or someone that you struggled with more. Well, on the one on the one hand, I loved them all, and I struggled with them. <laughs> them all. <laughs> They're ended. all problems. <laughs> They're all problems, and they were all, you know. Once I understood who they were, they, you know, I I loved them. I mean, I think that um, Evie obviously is the most is close to you know, most close to me, mm -hmm. and especially as often she was trying to under trying to get to the bottom of what she didn't understand, which is very much the position of any writer in the middle of her story. You know, it's just like, I know that this means something. I just can't figure out what, you know? And so in that case, and also she was the easiest because she's, it's so familiar and not only the present, but also her, you know, position as a, as a professor. 
Kitty, the matriarch, I really, because she does something at which is really horrific, sort of in the beginning of the book, or in the middle, or the sort of beginning third of the book, and she does something that in fact then haunts her through the rest of the um, novel and is the secret that is buried throughout the novel that she doesn't tell, but it's the one that keeps returning to her. I needed to make her not a monster, not an anti-Semitic monster, because just for your your listeners, it has something to do with denying a Jewish person something. So I in I wanted to make her. Um, not dismiss, not not so monstrous that you just dismissed her. I wanted her also to be complicated, and that her the the thing that she does might also be explained by something that had happened to her. Yeah. And so the first chapter, I mean, you know, the first chapter is basically what happened. This this thing that happens that was kind of hair raising to write Mm -hmm. and also Mm -hmm. I realized essential to kind of humanizing her Mm -hmm. so that's a that's an example of where she was tricky until I understood what I could do you know what I could um yeah how I could write a story for her or around her and you know I loved writing Moss because I am a singer myself I I was an acapella singer in college as was he I loved writing his scenes. There are several scenes, especially on the island, where he and his um, members of his singing group gather and, and you know, you listen to, to music being sort of sent forth into the sky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I will say, I think that really worked with Kitty mm-hmm. because at the time that I, you know, listened to what she did, I did have a sharp, intake of breath. Uh, but really, at the same moment, a rush of of explanations or excuses or, yes, uh, you know, I, I understand why why this happens, even though, yeah, you do have that sharp intake of breath. Well, I hope this is all uh, very enticing to my listeners, uh, because I think you would really enjoy this book and also, you know, just enjoy getting to learn about there's my mother. Speak of the devil. Ah, <laughs> Granny K. And Granny K, exactly. Yeah, I think my listeners would really uh, enjoy this particular book, but also just learning about Sarah Blake as a novelist. Uh, so, Sarah, thank you again uh, for joining us. And before I let you go, is there anything you'd like to share with the audience or refer them to that I should put in the show notes? Nothing that I can think of immediately. I mean, of course, the more of us who are in this conversation about, um, you know, this country and this country's uh, memory and um, structural memory and um, the the better. And um, if you come to my book and read it and, and um, enter that conversation, I, I'm, I'm so glad for that. You can um, write me at uh, Sarah Blake Writes, which is my website. Um, I will respond. I love talking to book groups. But I, I have to say, above and beyond books and the conversation that books um, sort of send out into the world between readers and writers, this year, all I can say is, what do we do? Vote. Mm. <laughs> right. Yes. Take a quick break from your reading and go vote. Go. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks again, Sarah. It was lovely to have you on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. Pleasure. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Our goal in 2024 is to expand our audience because we get such great guests. So we'd love your help in spreading the word by sharing, subscribing, liking, thumbs upping, rating, and commenting. Got all that? Really, thanks for any support. Books, Shows, Tunes, and Mad Acts is brought to you by Discreet Guy, the training company for improving your speaking and writing skills. Also, a shout out to Podomatic, our podcast hosting platform. You podcasters out there might want to check them out. They've been good to us. And finally, thanks to Quintas Morera for the theme music. Music.